Bible's books. Uh, actually, what happened was Sister White requested that somebody do uh, some uh, a book on Daniel and Revelation, and what she asked them to do was put them in one book together. And uh, Brother Haskell then came along after that council, and he wrote his two books, but they were in separate editions. And uh, the writing style between the two men is uh, different, and they're both very good. Haskell's books are excellent. Smith Smith's books are excellent. But one thing you should know about Uriah Smith's early work is that it had some problems other than the King of the North. Uh, and in Daniel 11, around verse 36, he starts to go astray. And he uh, teaches that uh, the King of the North is uh, the Turkish power. And uh, he was led to those conclusions by the newspapers of his time. He was using current events. About, uh, there was a Turkish question at that time, just uh, at the last few years of the close of the 19th century, and he uh, was influenced by what he was reading in the news. And so uh, he was a deep student of uh, the book of Daniel and Revelation. And uh, one of the things that, uh, because I love books so much, I was when I found this out, I was a little saddened by it. You know, we haven't done a good job with uh, our pioneers, and we the library that Smith had is one of the largest collections on the works of Daniel Revelation by authors outside of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. When he died, we lost that library. We do not have it. That's right. And so, uh, but his books are a work of a lifetime. And just like progressive light as it moves forward, Smith had to move forward with it. And so when he first became a Seventh-day Adventist, he came out of an Aryan background. He believed that uh, Christ was only human. He didn't believe in the correct understanding of uh, the Son of God, that he was divine, that he was God in the flesh. And uh, so in his experience, he had to sometimes face his uh, background. And, uh, at the death of James White, he became the sole editor of the Review and Herald. And when he uh, did so, some of his uh, old habits came back. You know, old habits are hard to break. And, uh, so what he ended up uh, doing was uh, uh, leaning a little bit towards his Aryan beliefs and his also his uh, understanding of the King of the North he held to the day of death. So those are the things you need to watch for in his works. But otherwise, his works are rock solid. Sister White wouldn't make the statement about the man that his uh, book Daniel Revelation is God's helping hand. Uh, just as a whimsical statement, she's letting us know that its content is uh, meat uh, for the people of God. And Haskell's books, when you read them, especially, both are very excellent, but uh, he couches it in such a way as to uh, allow you to see Advent history within its writings. In both Daniel and Revelation. Because he takes you in uh, to and the history of uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And that's where some of our, uh, uh, we have a friend in England, Russell Williams, and he, by reading uh, Elder Haskell's book in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, specifically the book of Revelation, has uh, brought uh, wonderful uh, things from God's word. So that's about, that's the basic difference between the two. So does Haskell have the correct reading? Yes, yes. So Haskell was the one who defended the data that Ellen White had to tell him to stop. Okay. Haskell was rock solid to the day of his death. And that was the only question. Who's next? Does anybody else have a question about uh, that I can answer? I just wanted to comment on Haskell's book. Uh, you know, does, he, does, does he not also allude to the church's power in January 11th? Didn't he mean... Yes. Sympathize with Smith and Matthews. Who? Ask, ask, ask. He has the king of the North as well. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that, 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 that's correct, yes. Yes, that's right. You have to follow Harrison, right? Question. Yes. <clears throat> I haven't been attending every class, every, uh, every, this is my third day. Now, I saw this as many as, uh, uh, and I checked the Bible, and there are five mentions of uh, Pharaoh's sacrifice, sacrifice being added for the day. In chapter 8, Daniel, chapter 11 and 12. That's correct. And uh, chapter 8 has uh, three verses. Uh, 
That has that word. That word. And that and it was eleven uh, thirty one. Yes. And twelve eleven. And also yes. that. Yes. That's right. Uh, I would like to ask you to go over these texts, five texts, one after another, one by one, and uh, explain what this uh, means, context. You know, in what context of these uh, daily things go in? Well, we are see this daily uh, second thought of Christ with the paganism. Paganism. Well, we covered that in the class, but you must have not been here for that one. And uh, it takes a whole hour to do that. Yeah, it'll take a whole hour. Five, five, I have uh, I have video. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So now I would recommend the 2004 prophecy school. Right. We, we didn't deal with verse 12. We have dealt with verse 13 occasionally for different reasons. But in the 2004 prophecy school, we deal with that in detail. Is this the Ethan Green one? The what? The one? No. 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 is the one that we recommend where people start because it's got the basics on several things on the daily on Daniel 11. Okay, do you have said that people start? Yes. yes, we do. All right. Sorry, we couldn't take the time to answer all that question now. But, uh, I think in 2004, we take maybe four hours to answer that question. Wow. <laughs> so it's a little complicated, but it's very good once you get it. Okay. Any other uh, follow up questions? All right, each of each of us have been given questions. Um, the brother Apollo here, Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. Apollo. All right, he's given a list of quite a number of questions. We said we can't uh, answer all of them. He understood that. Uh, so we're just going to answer about uh, three of them. And I'll read the first one. It says, um, the number of 144,000, the people that are numbered 144,000 are said to be saved by Christ Jesus and go with him to heaven at the end of the world. What is the, the exact time of the end of the world? And what direction, and what, what will be left of those who are not picked by Christ Jesus, uh, to be 144,000? The one thing we, we know biblically, we don't have the exact time of the end of the world. But when we turn to the book of Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, in regards to the 144,000, um, we do not believe that only 144,000 will be saved. 144,000 are a special group of people that give the wrong cry to the world, and they're the ones that do not see death. Revelation chapter 7, you have 144,000 that are sealed. You can read that, verses 1 through 4, or actually 1 through 8. 144,000 sealed by the seal of the living God, they do not see death. But then in verse 9 and onward, there's another group mentioned as a great multitude. Verse 9 says, After this I beheld and know a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. They had victory. So it's not just 144,000, but there's a great multitude that no man could number. Amen? And then, let's go to another one of the questions. Um, it says, Who wrote the New Testament after Jesus was crucified? And did Jesus give his apostles the full authority to do it with his blessing? Let's look at just a few verses. Let's turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. All right. We're going to look at 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. The Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture. So not just the Old Testament is inspired, but the New Testament is inspired as well. And usually the New Testament bears the name of the author, whether it be John, or James, or Matthew, or Mark. The majority of the epistles were written by Paul. All wrote those, but they had full authority. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
And then there's one more we can look at in Peter. In 2 Peter, another good one. 2 Peter, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that phrase, in old time, means at any time. So there was never a time where Scripture was given by inspiration of man. It was always inspired by God. So those who wrote the Bible, both old and new, had full authority from Jesus Christ. What about those that are not lacking in faith in God, but are further than look to Jesus and by man at the same time, uh, you know, to find me a family of which to come to now you, you have to say that again. Say that again. Okay. You said it's inspired by God, not by man. But then put both together and put Jesus to the man, and he also put it in the world of God. So, how do you explain where it comes from? Or not? And it might end with this. He's inspired by God and the Father. Well, well, notice this verse here, the one that we just read. Can you repeat his question? His question was that Jesus Christ was God, but he was also man. So if Christ inspired the word of God, then wouldn't it be inspired by man as well? And so I was going to answer just by the verse here. It says in verse 21, For the prophecy came out of the old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it was the Holy Spirit that inspired all the prophets to write. Amen. All right. Amen. We also have the text of scripture, and I'm, I'm bad with numbers, but we also have the text of scripture where Jesus said, I came not to speak of myself, but what the Father gives me to speak. So what he spoke came from the Father as well. And just like he said, I will give you the comforter, and he will not speak of himself, he will speak for me and my Father. Right. It still comes from the Father. Oh, so the Bible is fully inspired, amen? And then this last one here is, why is Satan alive when Christ should have destroyed him from all his, his, his horrors and his sins? Well, I'll, I'll answer this in a very, I'll answer this in a way that I explain it to my children. That's how I explain it to my children. If, if as a parent, I've told my children not to get cookies out of the cookie jar, if you go into this cookie jar and get cookies out of the cookie jar, I'm going to punish you. You're surely not. And then, that's how I explain it to the children. My wife and mom have to tell you. So, you know, I find out that my children have dipped into the cookie jar, and I come downstairs, I notice the cookie is missing, so I get the, you know, the, the knife and the meat cleaver, and I set the one who took it, and I cut her head off. The other two children, from that point in time, when they obey me because of love or fear, it would be fear. It would be fear. It wouldn't be love. They fear me. See, the angels in heaven and the unfallen worlds had no understanding of the mystery of iniquity. It was something that was new. Sin was new. So Satan's plan had to be unfolded throughout the ages. And so at the, at the time where Christ was crucified, it was really at that point where the, the, the affections of many were separated from Satan. They saw that Christ was, Christ was righteous. He was holy. And yet, you know, he was killed. And so the plan of Satan has been going throughout history, going throughout history, unfolding, to where finally now people can make a conscious decision. And when Christ finally destroys Satan, people will not see it as, you know, now they have to obey because of fear. They will recognize Satan's plan, they will recognize his character, they will recognize the destruction of sin is just. Whereas before that, it never happened. Amen. Right. He has to go. That's right. That's right. Now there's two other questions here. It says, um, Josiah Lich's calculations for the fall of the Ottoman Empire gave credence to the message. Uh, is, is there any calculations that could have been made to predict the fall of the USSR in 1989? Well, that's the whole principle. Did, didn't Josiah Lich predict that? No, no, no. Who is where? Huh? We're, talk, we're talking about the fall of the Ottoman Empire or the USSR. The USSR. No, that was really weird. That's, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's where we're at. That's the point we're going to go, go to. It wasn't a time prophecy involved with that, as far as the calculations. I don't know who wrote the notes, so I'm just kind of looking around. But in Daniel 11, verse 40, 
back in the, the, was the 1940s, early 1940s, late 1940s, uh, there was a pastor by the name of Lewis Ware that put into print, uh, based upon the prediction of Daniel 11, verse 40, that the USSR would fall. So, and that was in 57? That was in 1957. So based upon Bible alone, and the spirit of prophecy, he went through and he saw that very clear. Yeah, but if they would fall, they would be brought down from an alliance between the papacy, the king of the nurse, and, and the Protestant power. Right. And so he saw that very clear. It was it was was after the 89? No, he didn't give a date to it. No, because the conclusion was that it would, it, that was the next thing that was to be, uh, uh, revealed out of the book of Daniel. Louis Rear saw it very clearly. Right. He connected it to the last six verses of Daniel. Right. Read. Right. But Louis Weir was a student of prophecy and he knew that he could not put time on it because according to uh, Revelation 10 6, that there would be a prophetic time after 1844. No longer. So, as far as the question asked if there was a calculation, uh, there's no prophetic calculation as far as time. But prophetic events is very clear in Daniel 11. What happened to us, I've slept on. Uh, so that wasn't something that empowered the movement then, but it's calculated to empower our understanding now. One of the things you need to understand, really, where was, where was familiar with the uh, aspect of the midnight cry landing in Daniel 1140, is that the collapse of the Soviet, I mean, the uh, French, the French Revolution and the death of the Desert Vacancy, that between there and the uh, battle between the King of the North and the King of the South, lands the midnight cry when time is no longer so. All right, so I would point you to Daniel 11, verse 40. Then there's a question of Revelation 13, verses 11 and 12, dealing with the Lamb-like beast of the United States of America. It says, these verses tell us that the Lamb-like beast causes the earth to worship the first beast, the papacy. We are also told that the national apostasy is quickly followed by national ruin. It says, if the United States meets national ruin shortly after Sunday law, how can they enforce the worldwide Sunday law? Well, there's two things. We, we, can, we can turn to Revelation 13 just to kind of go through that. It's very familiar ground for Adventists. But one thing that we need to understand is that there's, it's a biblical principle that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. You saw that in history, you saw it in Hagar, you have national apostasy in 321 with the Sunday law, national ruin in 330, but that doesn't set a precedence on time. Okay, it says it's quickly followed, it's quickly followed by national ruin, but as far as the time in between that, we don't know time frame, whether it's months, years, we don't understand that. But it's very clear that from the beginning to the end, the United States is the muscle that causes the world, forces the world to worship the beast. Whether its monetary systems are collapsed, it still has nuclear weapons. Amen? Still has nuclear weapons. Revelation 13, these are the verses, verse 11. It says, I, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, had two horns like a lamb, straight as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Now the first beast before him was given power, seat, and authority. And the power was military power. And with that power, he persecuted the saints. So when you come to verse, verse 12, it says he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. This is military power. And he causeth the earth and them which were dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And as you keep reading down all through the verses, it's with that power, that force, that he pushes the world. But that national apostasy that follows national ruin is not just what happens in the U.S., but goes throughout the whole world. As national apostasy moves into Europe, then there's national ruin. National apostasy moves into Africa, then there's national ruin. It's a principle that, that continues on. The U.S. is the muscle behind it. Amen? Amen. 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 That, that, that's an easy thing to see in prophecy. So whether you want to say that there's national ruin, that doesn't mean that the muscle is taken out of the back of the United States. It's still here. You don't need a dollar to set off the bar. Amen? All right. We're going to write the rest of the questions down. No, for the paper jazz, like 15 questions. Right. You, you can jump in. Well, there it's, 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 the statement is education 228, or 228 or 288, I forget that. Um, I haven't written down the notes in the back. But basically the principles uh, 
of the French Revolution, the fact that uh, the liberties were taken away from the people, that, you know, worship was something that was, you know, uh, worship was something that was, you know, lightly regarded, even though we understand that there was a frenzy that was brought out afterwards because of those suppressions. We see that, you know, worship is already being suppressed, prayer taken out of school, all these different things, but it's going to cause a frenzy to go back. Go back to worship. And that's what's transpiring now. Yeah, they, what, what was that the Bartholomew Massacre. Well, there was a battle that went on with the Word of God. There was histories there that, that went together. Well, she asked you about the Bartholomew Massacre. Was that the connection with the French Revolution? She was asking if that's what began it, and is that the massacre going to be repeated? That, that kind of connection. Yeah. Well, there was a connection between it, but they were first. You can, you can check. <laughs> no, it's not a question. No, 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 go ahead. Well, the St. Bartholomew's Massacre happened uh, some years in advance of the French Revolution. But when you read Ellen White's comments in the book Great Controversy, the issue in France was over whether or not uh, Catholicism would carry out the policy. And she says that the legitimate result of the French Revolution was the uh, suppression of the scriptures by the Roman Church in France. And St. Bartholomew's Massacre is directly related to the French Revolution based on the fact that they were following Catholic principles. That was, it was a rebellion against Rome. It was a rebellion against Rome. We, 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 we see that in, in Bible prophecy. With but, a, but the two events were first. separated by a number of years in history. But when you begin to understand it, you'll see that the St. Bartholomew's Massacre is the result of the policy of Rome. And the French Revolution is, she says, the legitimate result of those same policies. I have a presentation that I'm going to do here where I'm going to show this. It works. It's easy to see. And it's minor in the so don't be threatened by what I'm going to say. It's a new concept for you. But the, the history of all seven churches from Ephesus on to Laodicea are repeated here in the world in the time period of Laodicea. So that you it's easy to see. And it doesn't threaten that misunderstanding. But when we get to that point, We'll also try to show that what brought about the revival in the history of Ephesus was the book of Daniel. It was Dan John the Baptist was working upon Daniel chapter 9. What brought the revival of the Millerite history was the book of Daniel. What brings the revival to the 144,000 was the book of Daniel. But those histories uh, are, are Ephesus, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But the French Revolution is dealing with the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. And this, there was a, an empowerment of God's people that preceded Pergamus. It was on the book of Daniel. Okay? Sister White, in Great Controversy about page 50, says that the faithful Christians, as the papacy was taking control of the church, they decided they have, had to separate. The, the reason they had to separate, Sister White is clear, is based upon Paul's writing in Second Thessalonians is that there would be a falling away from it. But Sister White's also clear that Paul was basing the passage in Thessalonians upon the book of Daniel. Yeah. And so the empowerment of the Pergamus church, the true church, separated from the Catholic church, was brought about also by the book of Daniel. So again, in Revelation 11, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy for the 1260-year time period, clothed in sackcloth, they were empowered prior to Thyatira, and Thyatira is repeated because the Catholic Church is once again going to rule the world, and the empowerment that is being mentioned in Revelation 11 is the empowerment of the 144,000 that are going to stand in this bloodbath that's going to take place at the papacy at the end of the world. And Revelation 11 is an illustration of the end of the world, and we don't have time to go on with it, but to be clear about your question, Revelation 11 aligns up with the end of the world, the seventh the seventh plague at the end of the world is the earthquake, and you'll notice that the earthquake of the French Revolution is preceded in Revelation 11 by the resurrection of the two witnesses, which yeah. is the special resurrection of Daniel 12 at the end of the world. Okay, so Revelation 11 
in the sense that it is Pergamus and Thyatira. It has a point-by-point point parallel to the end of the world when he lines up with the plagues and the bloodbath of the papacy and the empowerment of the 144,000. It definitely is repeated, but it takes a little bit of time, far beyond the scope of what we have here to show us. But it blows your mind how much God's Word is simply the same old story repeated over and over again. Do you have more questions? No. Well, maybe our time is up. As far as how much time I have? No, no, we only have time. Lunchtime. It's lunchtime, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was close to prayer. I need that. I need volunteers for the kitchen. All right, we need how many? Three. 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 One more volunteer. One more you don't need. There we go. Amen. All right. So let's have a word quick. I love you, Father in heaven. We ask a blessing there, Lord, upon the spiritual food that we have partaken of. We ask the Lord that we nourish our bodies. Now, Lord, as we partake of the physical food, we ask the same blessing. We ask you, Lord, to help us to return to it. Help us, dear Father, when we return to the meetings, we would have our clear minds and clear hearts to be able to discern Jesus' name.